Treasurer, can you please call the roll? Mrs. Gerken. Here. Mrs. Barnwick. Here. Mr. Vasquez. Here. Mr. Parker. Here. Ms. Barnes. Present. Now, Dr. Durant, can you please recite the mis mission and vision? Yes, TPS mission is to produce competitive college and career ready graduates through a rigorous curriculum across all grade levels by implementing how uh, new standards with fidelity. Our vision statement is try to be an A rated school district whose graduates are college and career ready. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Duran. And can you go ahead and, and continue with the presentations, please? Yes, we're going to turn this over to Ms. Mazur. Back over to me. In honor of Black History Month tonight, we would like to include the Black National Anthem. This version will be sung by Kurt Franklin, the Grammy winner, gospel artist, and songwriter. Can everybody please rise? participating and honoring Black History Month with the Black National Anthem. Now I will turn over to Vice President Parker. Good evening to you all and we have a resolution that will be recognizing Dr. Crystal Ellis also as part of our Black History Month. We are paying tribute to one of Toledo Public Schools icons. A resolution honoring Dr. Crystal Ellis and recognizing Dr. Crystal Ellis Day at Toledo Public Schools. Whereas Dr. Crystal Ellis was a pioneering athlete and educator, and whereas Dr. Ellis attended Bowling Green State University, BGSU, and was the first black member of the school's basketball team, and whereas Dr. Ellis left BGSU to enlist in the United States Army to help financially support his parents, and whereas Dr. Ellis returned to BGSU to earn a bachelor's degree in education and later earned both a master's degree and PhD degree in education. And whereas Dr. Ellis served Toledo Public Schools, TPS, as a physical education teacher and coach at Libby High School, and later served as an assistant principal at DeVilvis High School and a principal at several TPS schools. And whereas Dr. Ellis served as the district's first black superintendent providing unwavering leadership and commitment to TPS students and staff. 
And whereas Dr. Ellis has made significant contributions to TPS, both inside and outside the classroom, and whereas Dr. Ellis remains an inspiration to TPS students, staff, and the community, and whereas TPS wishes to honor Dr. Ellis and express gratitude for his service to the district, now, therefore be it resolved by the Board of Education of Toledo City Schools District that, Section 1, the Board hereby honors the life and achievements of Dr. Crystal Ellis and recognizes his countless contributions to TPS. Section 2, the Board hereby recognizes every first Friday in February as Dr. Crystal Ellis Day. Section 3, the Board will encourage and support activities that celebrate Dr. Ellis' legacy. Section 4, this resolution shall be in full force and effect from and immediately after its adoption and shall supersede any prior resolution or act of this Board which may be inconsistent with the provision of this resolution. And Section 5, it is hereby found and determined that all formal actions of this board concerning and relating to the passage of this resolution was taken in the open meeting on this of this board and that all deliberations of this board and of any of its committees that resulted in such formal action were in meetings open to the public in compliance with all legal requirements including section 121.22 of the Ohio revised code. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion? Uh, I think that this, uh, I'm so excited to have this resolution and to honor Dr. Ellis. And often I think if I could only live the life that he has lived um, in the things that he has done uh, he's been a great uh, example. He's been a great mentor. And uh, I can't think of anybody who's more deserving than uh, Dr. Christo Ellis. And it's just my honor to be a part of honoring him right now. Thank you. Board member Bart, are we? Yeah, thank you. Um, Superintendent Ellis, um, we certainly appreciate you. We applaud you. You have set the pathway for future generations. And that I don't think can be duplicated in any way, shape or form. Uh, you are unique and we are so blessed to have had you as our first African-American superintendent. Thank you. Board Member Gerken. Thank you, Madam President. It's, it's times like this where uh, I get to reflect back on how many years I've been affiliated with this district and, and, and I'm reminded that it's going on, you know, five decades or four, at least four decades. And uh, Dr. Ellis, I think I was the secretary of the Dean's office at Woodward High School when you were the principal at, right down the street at Leverett. And I remember just, you know, on the occasion that you would have to uh, stop into uh, to Woodward, probably to visit some of your former students and check on them and to make sure that, uh, that they were still benefiting from your, uh, your mentorship and support and just how uh, even then, um, who knew you were going to end up being superintendent and I was going to be on the Board of Education. Uh, it, it's, it's really cool to be able to think back and say, I knew you then, too. And you continue to serve this district, and I, I don't know how many years since you've retired, but uh, multiple times a year, your service is brought back to our attention, whether it's with a, a levy or, or, um, or what it is that you're called to do. So you continue to serve and we continue to benefit from your uh, passion and commitment to education. And I am uh, very honored to have known you. Vice President Parker. Thank you, Madam President. Dr. Ellis, I just want to say thank you so much for your service and your continual work that you have done and continue to do. I stand in this place because of your life, because of who you are and who you have become. A few months ago, I don't know if you remember, we were in Rite Aid together, and I wanted to sit on the floor at Rite Aid Indian style and just learn from greatness as you were speaking to me. And I took all of that in. Because of who you are, I am who I am. And I thank you for the opportunity just to be who you are. Even now, you're not into accolades and things of such. I, I spoke to you a little while ago and said, this is not about me. You always make sure that it's about the children. 
And so we thank you and we celebrate you. And this is an honor to do this resolution to celebrate your life while you can see and hear it. Dr. Ellis, um, I am so grateful to have met you. Um, because of you, we are sitting here, um, and I'm going to be honest, as a black school board member, um, to tell people that I know the first black superintendent um, and to know a history maker, um, coming from a history maker, I'm just saying, um, is an honor. Um, and so when Vice President Parker presented this opportunity to celebrate you and give you your roses, um, it was a no-brainer for our board to say yes. And we are so happy that now we get to share you and celebrate you every year, first Friday in February, and also happy belated birthday. Treasurer, please call the roll. Mrs. Gherkin? Yes. Mrs. Varwig? Yes. Mr. Vasquez? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Ms. Barnes? Yes. Dr. Durant? Dr. Ellis, again, uh, I want to say belated happy birthday, 90 years strong. Not, I put that all on that, on that TPS water, but keep drinking that TPS water. <laughs> but again, in regard to thank you for being a trailblazer in regard to the first African-American superintendent TPS, there would be no Dr. Eugene Sanders without a Dr. Ellis. There'd be no Dr. Romulus Durant without a Dr. Ellis. And at the end of the day, you have paved the way for many to myself as those to come. But at the same time, you've touched the lives of many, many students and your work in the after school club. I know many individuals says, Dr. Ellis is the one who taught me how to swim. And so a true appreciation for what you have done in regards to the city of Toledo, the youth in Toledo, and all that you've done for TPS. And so this is just a small token of your uh, appreciation. At the same time, Toledo Technology Academy of Engineering, which is one of the most renowned engineering high schools uh, in the region. Uh, one of the centers is named after Dr. Crystal Ellis. And so we're doing a multi-million dollar renovation to that facility that ends in the fall of 2024. But I wanted to make sure that you saw the rendition of that building that bears your name on the outside of the building. Ms. Mazur, back over to you to continue presentations. Thank you very much. National School Counseling Week was celebrated earlier this month. School counselors are actively engaged in helping students examine their abilities, strengths, interests, interests, and talents. They focus on positive ways to enhance students' academic, career, and social-emotional development. They work with teachers and other educators to provide an educational system where students can realize their potential and set healthy, realistic, and op optimistic aspirations for themselves. School counselors work with all students to remove barriers to learning by addressing students' academic concerns, career options, social-emotional skills. They are, much, they are a much-needed resource for students, parents, teachers, and administrators. School counselors are an integral part of a student's successful plan for graduation. Tonight, we have two of our counselors here to talk about what they do each and every day to support our students. Please welcome Don Burks from Martin Luther King Academy for Boys and Susan Kissinger House, not House, oh, I'm so sorry, from Westfield. <laughs> okay. You're good. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, the American School Counseling Association's theme this year for the National School Counseling um, Year is Dream Big. We want you to hear what it is like to dream big as a school counselor in Toledo Public Schools. If you notice on your desk in front of you, we've laid some folders and also a stress ball for different fun. <laughs> we've always got to bring the fun. But you'll see um, a plethora of information for your reading pleasure, as well as the um, PowerPoint presentation that we're going to show you today. I can see it. Excuse me so much. Oh, I guess I need to see it. I don't know where to stand. I'm sorry. We can go back. Okay, I'll be good. All right, in front of the mic. Did you all hear what I said about your packet? Okay, very good. So if you notice, now I've got to get technical here. 
here we go. We're gonna go through um, just four areas. One is the history and the, the role of the school counselor as well as some data that we'd like to show you and also the life and duties of an elementary and high school counselor. Um, with the history of, um, one moment please. It, school counseling has been in existence for about 100 years. Um, it started off in 1960s and basically focusing on vocational purposes. Um, in 2001, federal legislation acknowledges the terminology and switch from guidance counselor to school counselor as we are embracing and helping students with their academic, social, and emotional, and career. Um, 2003 to present, many states and districts support the ASCA, which is the American School Counseling Association National Model for Standards and quali um, Qualifications, which you will notice on the next page in um, the role of the, suit count of the school counselor. Oh, we're gonna do this too. Here we go. Oh, there we go. I'm sorry, folks. Okay, so the role of school counselor up in the left, it shows the qualifications of the school counselor and the areas that we focus on on the bottom, the leadership and team members. And then what ASCA actually lays out as the appropriate duties, including and providing these, state, these things. Um, in TPS, we're unique because we're, we are called administration. That's not the case in many, in many districts across the state. Um, so it's, it's important that we do focus on what ASCA outlines as what our duties are and what is deemed as appropriate for school counselors. Next slide, please. All right, school counselors matter. School counselors play an important role in ensuring students have an excellent educational experience. Students of color and students from low income families benefit from having access to school counselors. The ASCA recommends that schools maintain a ratio of 250 students per school counselor and that we spend at least 80% of our time working indirectly and directly with students. We have begun to use SCUDA, which is a pilot program here in TPS that collects data and will support us as we move to data-driven, evidence-based school counseling program. This program is important to determine how and when we are serving our students. The re research shows that when you have enough school counselors in a high poverty school setting, you will see better academic outcomes, improved attendance, fewer disciplinary incidents, and higher at graduation rates. Our current data in your folder shows that the group of school counselors using SCUDA are working directly and indirectly with students 52% of the time, and that 27% 20 of our time is spent doing non-school counseling things. Comprehensive school counseling program, kindergarten through 12th grade, focuses on the academic, the social, emotional, and the career of each student. Each student starting in sixth grade needs to have a success plan towards graduation, and counselors help to start that and to see that through high school as the, counsel the counselors in the high school pick that up. Um, I do just want to point out that the social emotional piece is like the most important part because as in Maslow's hierarchy of need, if you do not meet those basic social and emotional needs, you're not gonna be able to rise to that level of academic and career possibilities. Um, so we have seen across the district that counselors have talked together and we've all noticed as well as teachers and, and our colleagues in schools that the mental health need has increased greatly just since COVID um, and our time is spent with some pretty severe mental issues. We decided, because you guys got a plethora of information, that we would just do a day in the life of an elementary school counselor. All right, the day begins between 7.20 and 7.30 at Martin Luther King Academy. I take off my coat and unpack my bag as fast as I can before I head to the main entrance area to greet kids. I like to be one of the first faces that the kids see when they walk through the door. By 7.40, I greet each kid good morning by name with a big smile as they walk down to the cafeteria and in, in return I get hugs smiles frowns groans runny noses high fives fist bumps and so much more between 8 and 8 15 I say let the games begin by 8 15 a student hasn't already been sent down um, out of the cafeteria to the office there is at least one student who has asked multiple times Miss Burks, can I come with you? Miss Burks, can I take a break? Miss Burks, can I eat lunch with you today? Then when the bell rings for the day, 
I um, race back to my office depending on the day to quickly check some emails, meet with a student who needs a break, head out in the hallway to monitor students, take a cougar cart to some classes, meet with a student who has already been sent down to the office because of his behavior, leave the building to get the food bags for the week or anything else that may need to be addressed. There is no typical day. It is anything but typical and varies drastically depending on the day. Around 9.30, a student has been sent down by his teacher to, to see me as a check-in, and then I get a phone call from a different teacher stating that student has acted out and needs a break and would like to send them down. I meet with both students individually after I have met with the first student and send him on his way, and then I move on to student number two. While meeting with second, the second student, who is upset because another student in his class called him out of his name such as boo-boo I receive a phone call from the secretary saying there's a parent on the phone who has concerns and needs to speak with me immediately I know I've planned to go into the classroom at 945 to do my lesson on bullying awareness so I speak to the student briefly and ask him what he should do when a student is not being kind we briefly walk through what that looks like and making better choices. I take the phone call while the student begins to play with my slinky, stress ball, and various other items in my office. While on the phone, the student in my office, who doesn't want to leave because they are having way too much fun with the fidgets and toys in my office, I have to stop the parent mid-sentence to say to the student, all right, it's time for you to go back to class. On the walkie-talkie, I hear the lead teacher ask who can take one of their students down the elevator because they are on crutches and then someone gets on and offers to help. Then someone else gets on to share that there is an issue in the kindergarten class and someone needs to come and get the student. I apologize to the parent about the distractions and continue to listen to their concerns. A cup of coffee would be great at this point. However, I really need to get off the phone so I can make it to the classroom I'm supposed to be at at 945. Finally, I get off the phone. It is now 10 o'clock. So I rush upstairs to the sixth grade class. I look at my Apple Watch knowing I'm going to get my steps in today. On the way to the sixth grade class, I encounter a second grade student who is wandering, wandering the halls, upset and crying. I stop to console him and decide it is best to take him to the office myself, knowing that if I don't, he may not make it to the office on his own. I take him to my office and call up to the sixth grade teacher and apologize and say, sorry, I'm running behind. She says, no problem. I know how it is in the life of a school counselor. Take your time and we can always reschedule. I say thank you and as I hang up the phone, I sigh, turn back around to the student in my office who is still crying and know that the day has just begun for me as a school counselor. I shared this short <laughs> and brief scenario, I know it sounded long, um, of what it may look like for a portion of a day in the life of an elementary school counselor. Each day is different, however, the impact we have on students' lives is vital to a child's development in all areas of their educational experience with academics, social emotional well-being, and career opportunities. I thought it would share a snapshot of what it's like at Westfield. Um, I arrived to school greeted by a student or two before I even get out of my car. They're offering to help me with anything that I have lugging into the building, which is always a, a welcome sight. Um, as they help me unload my car and we walk in, I see three students that come running up and ask if they can spend some time with me that day, so I take a mental note. We go to my office, unload everything, and then I come back down to the lobby to also greet, as, as Dawn stated, to my students and to, that I'm one of the first faces that they see. I notice that someone is struggling and I intervene with that student and invite to take them to my office. We go up, I ask them if they'd like a granola bar, a bottle of water and spend some time with them. During that time, a teacher calls and I notice um, that they have noticed a student been coming this week to school with no winter coat or shoes. I find out the student's name and after I take the other student back to class, I go pick up the student. I wanna do a shout out to Newsboys because without them, we would not be able to do the services that we do with our students on a daily basis. Um, that service is so important to us. Um, I talk with this student, I allow them to pick out the color of their coat and we look at the size and shoes and somehow measure their feet and try to make sure they're right and order their shoes. I look at the, my referral sheet and find out the three other students have referred teachers and so I start to call them to my office after taking the other student back to class. My phone rings, however, and it's a teacher stating that a student needs to speak with me. So I put that on the side and I go get the student. He is very frustrated because he feels like the teacher is not being fair with them. We talk through options of how he can handle the situation and I realize that he's not feeling confident to handle it on his own. So together he and I put an uh, email in, in motion to this teacher and help him with wording so that he can communicate properly and state the situation in a non-threatening way. 
this is a tricky balance for counselors as we are advocating for students daily, but we are also needing to meet teachers exactly where they are and recognize that everyone has a side. Um, make sure that both parties feel that we understand that we're there to just help them move through this process and, and to move forward and not to come off in any other way. We want both of them to feel that we're, um, I'm on their side and helping each with perspective, compromise, and possible mediation. Meanwhile, I'm called to come to the lobby. When this happens, I know that no matter what I'm doing, I need to get there. So I take the student back to class with a lot of promises. I'll be right back and we will finish what we've started. I get to the lobby to find another student, a new student who's very upset, yelling and hitting things, maybe putting a hole in the wall. Needing to assess the situation and start to earn the trust of this student from a distance and then the right to get a little closer and then hopefully to help them. Several of my students that come to Westfield are behavioral, or all of my students that come to Westfield are behavioral students, but several of them are in children's services care. And they've been bounced from group home to group home. Me, we have had six to eight students um, just since Christmas that have been placed from no, neighboring counties in Toledo. And these students coming to us are scared, angry, feeling out of their element, stressed, trying to size up their new surroundings, the new students they're in school with, their new group home. They come in like little cats being thrown into water, basically, is kind of how I see them. So after I spend 30 minutes and I've earned the right to spend some time with this student, we work through and get to a better mindset. I pass a colleague as I'm taking this student back to class and they ask if I got their email. It's at that point that it's 10 o'clock and I've not even had a chance to open my email. I pop my head into where that first student was to say, I've not forgotten you, but I actually have to go to a health class and I'll be back, I promise. At that time, another student asks if they can come see me. I, I tell them I'll see them, and I go to do a thorough lesson on sexual harassment and deal with inappropriate questions during the lesson and sometimes um, un fielding, I'm sorry, appropriate question, questions and some inappropriate questions and field those, and then get back to my office to hopefully take a bathroom break or maybe just a drink of water. On the way up to my office, I realize I cannot leave this kid hanging any longer, so I head straight to get them. At that point, my phone rings as we enter my office, and it is an apartment complex where I've helped one of my students who was left in 10th grade to um, go through the LMHA process and then spearhead furnishing for his apartment. And they are letting me know that they've sent several emails with no response and how important it is that I make sure to let him know to check his email because LMHA is coming to do an inspection and they need to make sure everything's in order. This is just a snapshot of a typical morning. We never know what we're gonna get when we walk in the building. We can have our best laid plans and they all get hijacked for more important issues. Um, we're not saying these things for you to feel sorry for us. We actually love our jobs and we must be thrill seekers, but we love it. Um, we are saying this because the role of a school counselor is very important to not only that social, emotional, academic, and career uh, possibilities for each student, and we believe very much in helping them to achieve their highest potential. TPS proud. I'd like to introduce um, quickly um, Jamie Brown, who we have just a few seconds of an interview. She was just recently um, interviewed by WTOL. They actually miss read her name or something and called her Mrs. Smith, but her name is Jamie Brown. And so we have just a moment of that interview to share with you. And she's present here today. Absolutely. We're not here to learn everyone's business. We're not here to, you know, you know, dish the dirt on everybody, but we're here to support them. We're give them coping skills, life skills. Um, and really just teach them how to be kind humans and just get along with each other. But Smith says social media and other factors has what? All right, and we'll move on to the last one. Last slide. Uh-oh. Yeah. All right, so as you can see, our mission is to pr produce competitive college and career ready graduates. The school counselor plays a big role in accomplishing this. And our goal is for our students to dream big. So as we have gone through National uh, School Counseling Week, that is what we, our mission has been 
and we continue to do that here in Toledo Public Schools. So thank you so much for your time. I know there's we went way over, so we appreciate that. So thank you for giving us the, the floor. Thank you, ladies. Um, and we have one retiree with us tonight, and that is Sandra Orth, literacy instructional coach. She will be retiring from Toledo Public Schools with 34 years of service. If she would like to come forward and shake hands with everyone. I just want to let you know you missed half the, the horseshoe. You got to go over there, too. You're getting, getting steps in today. <laughs> Thank you once again for your service, and thank you, Ms. Mazur. Now we'll turn over to the treasurer. All right, the next section is uh, community comments, and um, the board values the input of citizens and community members regarding all aspects of the district. The board understands that education is the center of all community issues and activities, and that input is important because it allows the board to hear all views on all matters. In order to ensure a quality public comment portion during board meetings, all citizens and community members who are scheduled to speak before the board shall abide by these general rules. One, each speaker has three minutes unless modified by the board president. Two, the time will be displayed for the speaker and public to see. The treasurer will announce when time has expired. Three, any questions that speakers would like responses to should be submitted in writing and the board president will secure answers within a reasonable time frame, normally seven to 10 days, depending on the amount of research required to provide a comprehensive response and the time sensitive nature of the question. Four, board members will not engage in policy dialogue with speakers, but will use their established committee format to have a substantive dialogue. The public comment section is the opportunity for the board to listen to all citizens and community members and make contact with speakers following the meeting for individual feedback and questions. The general guidelines are established as a way to provide the maximum opportunity for the board members to listen to citizens and community members and provide an organized and structured procedure for feedback that will help our students and families. Uh, we have one speaker tonight, uh, Albert Earl. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to uh, start simply by saying that I've heard that you guys are about to have a levy. Um, I think that is very important that uh, we get out and make, uh, make sure that that levy get passed. I vote for it every time you have one. But I think that is also very important that there be transparency because I know our people are going to want to know about what are you doing with the ARPA dollars, and now you sit having a levy. And it's very important that not only do we know what you're doing with the ARPA dollars, but are you spending it in the areas that's needed most? Learning loss, the social and emotional learning, and something to address the trauma that we know our children have been going through for the past few years. Also, um, 
I would like to uh, see something different when it comes to celebrating the the notion that we all should be TPS proud. And this is what I mean by that. I was riding down the street and I saw a billboard of two St. John's athletes who made it to the NFL and the NBA. And I was like, wow, why ain't there more advertising about the history of the athletes and, and engineers and educators that's done great things in Toledo? Because we don't do enough to counter the negative image that's out there. And I think that we should do that because it's important for the public to see that there's greatness that came out of this district. For example, <clears throat> there was a story on ESPN about uh, Mrs. Stringer, the coach, Vivian Stringer, who, who took her HBCU school to the very first inaugural Final Four, women's Final Four in 1982. Why is that connects to Toledo? Because we had two Libby Cowgirls playing in that game. One for Vivian Stringer for Cheney State, and then the other one was Meyer Waters that played for Maryland, and the other one whose name I didn't say is Anna Strong. That should have been a black history moment for not only Toledo but for TPS. We need to advertise what the greatness that come out of this district. Finally, I had a lot more to say, but I would, wouldn't dare come up here and not acknowledge my principal from Rogers, Mr. Ellis, who not only was a principal and became superintendent, but he was a father figure for many of us while we were in the school, even though most of us at that time had fathers in the home. He made sure that we did the things we were supposed to do, and he got on me all the time. And to this day, he don't call me Albert. He called me Mickey. And when I hear Mickey, I, I still hear that voice when I was running down the hall in Rogers. But I want to thank you publicly, and I love you for everything that you've done for us Rogers students. Thank you, Mr. Earl. And now we will come to Section 4, which is our organiz organizational input. Oh, I keep forgetting. I'm so sorry. So we will actually uh, be doing an amendment to our agenda. Uh, we will be moving up a discussion item that is very important um, and need much attention. Um, and board member Gerking will be re reading a resolution uh, opposing House uh, Senate Bill 1. Thank you, Madam President. Let me just say here we go again. Uh, this is the resolution opposing Senate Bill 1. Whereas the Board of Education of the Toledo City School District, the board believes that public education should be overseen by a nonpartisan and non-political department of education and that the public education system should be accountable to the citizens and communities it serves. And whereas local elected officials are in the best position to determine the scope and nature of education in their school districts and Whereas Ohio Senate Bill 1 strips the Ohio State Board of Education of significant educational responsibility and deprives students and families of a public education system that is accountable to local representatives. And whereas Senate Bill 1 dramatically shifts oversight of public education from the duly elected members of the State Board of Education to the political and partisan executive branch of Ohio's government. And whereas the board believes that any bill that so dramatically reshapes the public education system in Ohio should be thoroughly researched, discussed, and debated by education stakeholders, voters, and taxpayers, and whereas the board is unaware of any efforts that lawmakers have made to get input from local boards of education about this important legislation. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Education of the Toledo City School District that the board opposes Senate Bill 1 and urges lawmakers to vote against this legislation. The board believes that focus should be placed on making needed improvements to the Ohio Department of Education rather than allowing the General Assembly to unilaterally dismantle the public education system in Ohio before the General Assembly is permitted to undemocratically strip the authority of duly elected officials of the State Board of Education, the General Assembly should take the time to gather meaningful input, perform necessary research, engage in sincere dialogue, and allow for honest and open conversation with the citizens of Ohio 
to identify and evaluate proposed changes to Ohio's public education system. Number four, this resolution shall be in full force and effect from and immediately after its adoption and shall supersede any prior resolution or act of this board, which may be inconsistent or duplicative with the provisions of this resolution. And it is hereby found and determined that all formal actions of this board concerning and relating to the passage of this resolution were taken in an open meeting of this board and that all deliberations of this board and of any of its committees that resulted in such formal action or in meetings open to the public in compliance with all legal requirements, including section 1 to 1.22 of the Ohio Revised Code. Thank you, Board Member Gergen. May I get a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion? Well, I, uh, Madam President, I think that uh, resolution says it all. I think it begins with this um, Senate bill taking away the oversight of elected officials and giving it to uh, a uh, department of uh, government um, that could be partisan. It doesn't matter what, what uh, party uh, it is, but it is taking it away from uh, elected officials. Um, I think it's just the beginning of uh, what's going to happen. Uh, I think it, it uh, demonstrates uh, a uh, uh, philosophy, an ideology uh, that, that's definitely going in the wrong direction. I think that education and the oversight of education needs to be left in the hands of the people who uh, were elected to represent uh, public schools. Board Member Bar Barwig. Thank you, Madam President. Um, while we're certainly voting no on this one, um, there were 11 members that are elected. Um, yeah, I'll be voting yes on this, I'm sorry. <laughs> I am not feeling well tonight. This is why we moved everything up so I can um, leave right after this. Uh, 11 members elected by the voters on the State Board of Education, and that is critical when we think about democracy is being able to vote for our elected officials, and they are held accountable to the public. This is pure government overreach by the governor's office. There are 29 House and Senate bills just dedicated to education right now and counting. 29, right out the gate. Um, and at the end of the day, it's to decimate public education as we know it. We all know it's there. We all see what's happening. Um, and this is our opportunity to um, let the legislators know that we are going to be opposing um, all of what they want to do to public education because it's it's not pretty. And what we need, we need the public to stand up, speak out, make phone calls, bring testimony, write letters, send text messages. I don't care what you have to do to connect with your legislators, but you need to do it and do it now. Uh, this is dire situation for public education. Thank you. Board Member Gherkin. Thank you, Madam President. It's just uh, the dismantling of public education. It's very system systematic and it's uh, very deliberate. So make no mistake that this Senate bill and the other 29, 28, 29 bills that are coming at us are for the express purpose of removing local control of public education and literally decimating public schools in favor of school choice, in favor of not teaching the truth, in favor of making sure that social emotional learning is not allowed to be taught. So for those who want us to teach more social emotional learning, I would encourage you to help your legislators understand how important it is uh, in, in, uh, the, in the classroom. Uh, so we are under attack, make no mistake, we are not overstating it, uh, and we're going to keep giving you examples over and over and over about how the state of Ohio has in mind that public education is not a system worth having. Vice President Parker. Thank you, Madam President. My colleagues have said it best, and I agree with Ms. Gherkin with the term attack. 
it is absolutely an attack with this bill and 29 other bills that are coming up. It is an intentional attack on public education. And as Mrs. Vargwick stated, that we as a community, we have to make sure that our people are knowledgeable of the bills that are going forth and be able to speak loud, whether it's text, whether it's phone calls, whether it's testimonies, whatever the case may be, to let them know that we are going to stand with public education. And so we cannot allow the politics of this to overtake the reality that lives matter, our students matter, and we've got to be able to stand against the attacks. Thank you so much. Let's call this thing what a thing it is, and that's defunding public education. They're not going to say it. They're going to put bills. They're going to attack our teachers, our educators, and our staff for protecting and supporting our youth as they are. Um, they're going to make sure that we cannot celebrate things like we just did tonight with Dr. Chris, Crystal Ellis. They are doing exactly, I'm going to say it what it is, they're doing exactly what they did in Florida to where they are even questioning to teach Martin Luther King Jr.'s anything. They're removing history, not just black history. Let's be uh, real about that. If you're following the news, they are attacking humanity. Um, and this is an injustice. And we could do two things. We can be compliant by being silent, or we can make some noise and tell them that we are going to do everything to make sure we protecting our staff, protecting our educators, protecting our students and our school districts. Because I know my vote matters. And I know your vote, vote matters too. And I do not want to live in a state where our votes do not matter and they can make up anything they want and take that away from us because when they take away our vote, they take away our voices. Treasurer, please call the roll. Mrs. Gerken? Yes. Mrs. Barwig? Yes. Mr. Vasquez? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Ms. Barnes? Yes. Now we will move on to section four, which is our organizational input. Mr. Ramirez? Thank you. Uh, first, I was walking here thinking I don't have anything to say, but then I always do. So, Crystal Ellis, first of all, <clears throat> um, I wanted to say a couple of things. One is, first, first African American superintendent, you know, I'm thinking TPS is 175 years old. It took over 125 years to have an African American superintendent. First, I guess that's uh, why we have African American history. Uh, we need to continue to support and make sure that continues to happen. Next thing is, I wonder is how many female superintendents we've had, which I know is none, uh, but or one, but how many minority superintendent uh, female have we had? Uh, so we, we have some some work to do in our history. Uh, but uh, Dr. Ellis, I think um, you know there, there's a saying that says you never remember what they say, you never remember exactly what they did, but you certainly remember how they made you feel. And uh, Mr. Earl had mentioned it uh, to Rogers. I don't know if you know how many people you've touched over your career and your lifespan, uh, but I, I am certainly one of them when I was over here at the board and uh, taking your, your advice and guidance. I, I can tell you that uh, as a union, we always do a lot of leadership training, principal training. And any training they have, you know, they always say, think of a good leader. It was the first thing that comes, they always say that. And the first name, it, it, Anybody that's sitting next to me knows that it's Crystal Ellis that comes up into mind and uh, that we aspire to try to be. Uh, so I, I do thank you for your service and uh, being here today. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about was counselors. Obviously, I'd be remiss if you don't know my wife is a counselor, and she's, I'm sure she's sitting at the dining room table right now with her binders doing uh, graduation seals and schedules and grade checks. Uh, so they didn't mention that after school, what you, what you do. Um, you know, until eight, eight, nine o'clock at night when you go home. But also, I know she's working on Senate Bill One. Uh, as you know, she's very political, and I think we we need to oppose this absolutely uh, to take away our board.
Thank you, Mr. Ramirez. We're going to go ahead in section five, which is comments by the board. Board Member Vasquez. Uh, Madam President, I don't have any more comments. I think that I uh, commented on things I want to comment on. Board Member Gerke. I do just want to add one thing to this, uh, this discussion about the, the resolution um, that is taking uh, taking away our ability to have an elected state board of education that that makes any difference um and it's not because we've had any particular love for the current makeup of the state board of education <laughs> i just want to say that we've been up here doing resolution resolutions against their proposals right but the year is a different answer you don't just dis def make that board defunct you make sure you get appropriate people elected to that board which we were able to do uh just recently by adding a voice from toledo to the state board of education representing the, our particular region so um it's not because we think that it's always they're always doing the right thing either it's because we can't answer that with making them irrelevant. They are the elected officials. And if we want them to be different elected officials, we know what we need to do, just like we need different elected officials at the state house, obviously. So uh, it, it's, it, you know, the State Board of Education may not always be um, in, in any particular moment um, uh, looking out for the, for the urban schools, but we still have the ability to elect them. Uh, and, and we want to make sure we're preserving the ability to elect them at any given time and that's what uh, our opposition to this bill is more about vice president parker thank you my president i don't have any further comments mrs gherkin that was powerful thank you for that well i want to say happy black history year because we should celebrate back black history 365 um not just for a month because we have so much to pack um in and if you know your history you do your history i'm not going to be a history lesson person um, and, and I want to uplift uh, the board's action of opposing Senate Bill 1 because it's, it's all intertwined. When we're talking about the attack on, they want to call it CRT, it's not. It's about att uh, attacking what is right, being on the right side of history. Um, and when we're celebrating Black history, we're celebrating all history because Black history is all history. Um, and we have to acknowledge that. And I think what these folks that are keep attacking public education is getting wrong is when you have a healthy school district that celebrates and welcome all people from walks of life, you will have a healthy community. You will have a healthy network. Um, and it pours back in and forth But when you are disruptive and you are trying to dismantle the basic core of the community, um, we see the results and I wish the people at the state house would focus on the gun violence that we're seeing in our communities, the trauma that our kids are experiencing, the youth homelessness that is increasing and not during COVID, even before COVID, increasing um, to really help the school districts, to really care about what we are dealing with and not things that they are making up or making politicized. So I'll end on that. And then we will move to section six, which is our consent agenda. Agenda items 6.01 through 6.39 are the consent agenda items. Board members may request to pull an item from the consent and move it to the discussion section of the agenda. Item 6.01 through 6.06, .06, Human Resources Staff Development and Training Committee, Chair Board Member Gergen, Co-Chair Board Member Barnes. Item 6.07 through 6.16, Finance and Business Operations Committee, Chair, Board Member Vasquez, Co-Chair, Board Member Bar, I mean Barnes, Barwick, I'm tired, sorry. Item 6.17, Technology Improvements and Process Committee. There's no action this month, but the Chair is Board Member Kirk and Co-Chair, Vice President Parker. Item 6.18 through 6.20, Board Curriculum Instruction and in, in Academic Excellence, Chair Board Member Gergen, Co-Chair Board Member Barwig. Item 6.61 through 6.33, Policy Committee, Chair Board Member Vasquez, Co-Chair Board Member Barnes. 
Item 6.34 through 6.35, Arts, Athletics, and Student Activities Committee, Chair, Board Member Barwick, Co-Chair, Vice President Parker. Item 6.636, 6.36 through 6.37, Family and Community Engagement Committee, Chair, Board Member Vasquez, Co-Chair, Vice President Parker. Item 6.38 through 6.39, Approval of Board Minutes. May I get a, a motion to approve? So move. Second. Treasurer, please call the roll. Usually we don't have discussion on the consent agenda, but I, um, I know that there are people in the uh, audience here for a particular piece of our consent agenda, and I didn't want you to um, think that we, you know, aren't aren't paying close attention. But we bring everything to in one vote, and rather than pulling anything for discussion, I just wanted to give a shout out uh, for the folks here that are really excited about the lease uh, that we're providing for the uh, that, that we've approved uh, negotiations for the Libby property that's in actually your agenda um, from the business operations committee so I just wanted to say thanks for coming and, and uh, hanging out for our board meeting and we're you know we're happy to be helping you move that project forward and it is in the consent agenda we are voting on it all with one vote here today thank you board member Bar uh Board Member Gherkin. Treasurer, please call the roll. Mrs. Gherkin? Yes. Mr. Vasquez? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Ms. Barnes? Yes. Section 7 of the agenda consists of reports and minutes from the months of this month's committee meetings and are here for the information and reference. No action is required, so we can proceed to Section 8 of the agenda. Out Section 9 now. Which Section nine is walk-ins. Are there any walk-ins this evening? And then we can go ahead and proceed. Early childhood has a walk. Oh, I'm sorry. Please. Sorry. I've read an email. No, that's good. Keep reading the emails. That's good. Um, section, <laughs> so there's no walk-ins in section nine. So we're going to go ahead in section 10, which is early childhood education action items. I'm going to turn it over to Vice President Parker. Thank you, Madam President. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Allen. Section 12, Early Childhood Education Walk-In, is the Head Start ARP Extension Request. I'd like to request a motion to approve the Head Start ARP Extension Request, please. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second. Any discussion? If not, Treasurer, please call the roll. Mrs. Gherkin? Yes. Mr. Vasquez? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Ms. Barnes? Yes. Section 13 to 15, uh, now we will have comments by superintendent. Again, today we had a press conference regarding uh, our TPS foundation. Can't say enough in regard to coming in as superintendent that that foundation was defunct and uh, happy to say their campaign raised $1.3 million. So we're excited to see uh, that as a financial arm to the district. Um, again, uh, we got our Rogers girl playing tonight as well as start, start boys. So good luck for them for the district. Uh, and again, thank you for TPS Proud and Dr. Ellis, good to see you again. Treasurer. Okay, I have uh, two items tonight. They're in the handout in front of you. I'm just gonna <laughs> summarize them. The first one is the effects of House Bill 1 that will occur to the district if it goes through as currently uh, as it's been proposed. The first proposal is they would like to go to a standardized uh, income tax and the, uh, by doing that, it would cost the state $2 billion. So their revenues would be decreased by $2 billion. So we all know what that means is now they have to figure out how they're gonna pay for it. So the first part of the, how they're gonna pay it is they want to eliminate the 10% rollback on property taxes. So if we would stop right there, every parcel or every resident paying taxes, property taxes, would receive a 10% increase in their taxes. However, the state decided that that would not be very good probably for their re-elections, so they have proposed 
reducing the assessed value from 35% to 31.5%. 10% of 35 is 3.5, subtracted, it's 31.5%. So that would, in theory, reduce property taxes down. In theory, then it should be a net zero. However, they are discussing this in Columbus today, and I've not heard how the discussions are going. They have not taken into effect House Bill 920. So if House Bill 920 is followed there's one outcome. If it's not followed, the other, there's a different outcome. But in general, what happens if 920 is <clears throat> possible, then we will lose $13 million. If they do not use House Bill 920, then all taxpayers will see a tax increase. And in here it's not highlighted, but it's in number 10. It says, in essence, House Bill 920 would undo the intended effect of the assessment percentage reduction. So in my mind, that's telling me that they will choose to have the state and local governments, school districts, lose the funding so that the taxpayer stays at net zero. It's not been through, it's just been introduced. I don't really think they understand the total ramifications of the bill and all the tax analysts and so forth we're meeting with them today to go over all the issues so we'll keep you updated on that um and then on the last page uh the governor announced his budget back in february there we are towards the bottom but under his proposal we would see an increase from 197 million to 200 million next year and then an additional 2.8 million in 25 and there's also funding for uh, school resource officers of 3.5 million dollars so over the bonnie and budget they're saying it'd be roughly 9.6 million dollars so we could go into great detail into this but i don't want to bore you guys with all that so if you have any questions just uh, reach out and we'll go over it Thank you, Ryan. Board members, do you have any comments? Uh, it's uh, reassuring, Mr. Sexualty, that you're uh, uh, keeping, keeping track of all this because one bill then uh, affects another bill, then affects another bill, but the final effect is going to be on our funding the final effect is going to be on our community. Mm -hmm. um, sounds pretty intentional that it, it is hard to track uh, what, all, what all the impact is going to be. So it's, it's reassuring that, that you're doing that. I, I guess as a board member, I would like for you to continue to, to, to track that. I know it's a lot of time. We have our, um, our legislative uh, advocates on the board who are, who are uh, commenting on this and they're tracking it so I think all together we, uh, it we really need to do that it gets pretty complicated mm -hmm. so I guess I'm asking that you continue to do that you be very vigilant about doing it and that you give us continuous updates about how that how that's all going to affect um, all of our funding and everything that's going on uh, regarding that it gets complicated I appreciate you walking us through all of that. You're going to have to continue to do that so that we make sure that we understand all of that. Thank you. That's all. I'm trying to measure, <laughs> measure my words. I don't know if I can do it. Uh, so they're going to get us coming or going, one or the other, basically. And so if they... Um, Lower the valuation, it not only affects our ability to collect our local share, but everybody else who relies on property tax to collect their local share, but it keeps them out of trouble with the taxpayer. So that's one way they will get us, or they'll get us by 
um, just saying, oops, we're down a couple billion, so you just get less. And one other side effect of that is, is that the amount a levy, one mill levy would produce will go down, so we'll have to ask for additional millage to just to get back where we were even. I'm going to make this comment and then I, I'm going to say that this will be my to take the place of my last comments by the board. But um, it might be time, Dr. Durant, for us to look at um, at engaging a professional lobbyist on the behalf of the district. Not for only for this, but the 29 other house bills. And I know we have some shared stake in some lobbyists through uh, a couple of different organizations and presumably through all of our professional associations, whether it's uh, the Superintendents Association, School Board Association, I can remember a time where we did have our own um, advocate, our own uh, uh, lobbyist, and I, I think that we're, um, we're swimming upstream, and I think it's time to really take a more close look at uh, how we can do more on behalf of our own interests um, going forward. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about how we might approach that going forward. Vice President? No comments. Thank you. I just want to say, if you are not registered to vote, get registered to vote. If you are registered to vote, learn who's running for offices, all seats. Um, this is what we're seeing. Um, they have been playing chess and we've been playing checkers and now we are going to get the repercussions of that. They're going to try to take away public education. They have already tried to take away health care. And if you don't believe me, look at other states that are literally losing hospitals, losing school districts, um, mental health facilities. They are moving to make sure that they make America back to the good old days. And if you don't understand what that means, if you are not a cisgender, heterosexual, white, Christian, rich male with no disabilities, that means you're not included in that fight. Um, and so this is important to get your yourself registered to vote, learn who is running, um, and make sure you vote um, in your primary election and your general election. Um, because when we sleep, they take action. With that, I will like to make a motion to adjourn. So move. Oh, we're not. Thank you everyone for attending. Have a good night and drive safely.